Thanks, thanks a lot, CK. Uh, it's a pleasure, as always, uh, to speak to uh, some very talented, knowledgeable, uh, and experienced audience here. Um, I have spoken to maybe some of you have already heard me talk about different aspects, different application types where uh, the use of adaptive focused acoustics uh, made a significant difference to the outcome, which is the result. And today I'm going to highlight uh, how AFA is completely changing this landscape when it comes to working with formal and fixed paraffin embedded samples, commonly known as the FFPE. So uh, without further ado, uh, here's a bit of an agenda that I would like to follow. I'll once again, uh, for those uh, who have already been exposed to AFA related discussions, you pro it might be a, like a bit of a reputation, but for those who are new, um, I'm going to go over what AFA is, the features and its benefits and so on and so forth, and why AFA is becoming the go-to technology for sample preparation uh, for a huge number of laboratories, which is essentially resulting or causing our growth in the market. And uh, then I'll jump into FFPE samples, highlighting the challenges in working with FFPE samples. Most of you are probably fairly familiar with it. And then I'm going to go over and share a lot of data, whether it's extraction and purification of DNA, RNA, or extraction and purification, digestion of proteins. Um, finally, concluding with, you know, summary, uh, highlighting, you know, what kind of products make it happen. So, um, AFA, essentially, it's a, as I mentioned, the full name is Adaptive Focused Acoustics. So, essentially, it's an acoustic energy. The concept is very similar to what you all probably see in everyday life or, you know, very frequently in form of, you know, ultrasound and so on and so forth. So, it is a uh, a sub base um, frequency, what it is capable of doing is essentially providing an energy to the sample while keeping the total pressure uh, that is exerted on the sample at a bare minimum and also keeping the temperature constant. Now, while there are several other ultrasonicators that are available around us, uh, would tell you that, oh, it's a sonication at the end of the day, but the reason why those sonications often result in bad data is because they lack the control in ensuring that your sample is extracted from the matrix, but you get analytes, but they are degraded, they are damaged. And as a result of that, if you're working with the DNA, uh, your sequencing becomes erroneous. If you're working with RNA, your DV200 scores are bad. Um, if you're working with proteins, you don't have enough proteins so that you have even less peptides post-digestion. So the secret sauce of AFA is the frequency at which it operates, which is a uh, very long frequency, hence short wavelength, that helps us control the focal zone. So the energy is directed just directly into the samples. It's not moving all over the place, which is why, as you can probably see on the screen where my cursor is hovering, um, the pressure is very equally distributed. It's not all huge and all over the place. Also, there is no heat accumulation compared to other uh, technologies that are out there for sonication where there's too much of heat generated essentially causing thermal degradation of your samples. Now, I mentioned the secret sauce is in the frequency or the wavelength. So long frequency, short wavelength, and here comes, you know, typical sonicators in the frequency domain is somewhere bordering between sonic and ultrasonic, which is why, you know, most of you can probably hear it also when the energy passes through. Um, we play in the same uh, frequency range as that used in diagnostic imaging. So the MRIs, ultrasound, you know, um, MRIs, uh, of course, they work through magnetic resonance. Uh, ultrasound, it also generates uh, this energy, acoustic energy, which is in this ultrasonic domain, frequency domain. 
So what it does is that its wavelength in water is somewhere in this vicinity, which is far, far shorter than a typical energy wavelength experienced from a standard sonicator that you see out there. So what that means is if you have a short wavelength, it's easy for you, you to focus it to a certain sample than if you have a longer wavelength. It's just like if you have a small stick in your hand, you can point it and touch a certain thing within the range very accurately, as opposed to if you have a very long stick, it will always take you more energy, more pressure, more uh, muscle power, so to speak, to hold it and point it exactly where you want to show. So, um, that is the physics of our technology, but we then go beyond that and we go into certain areas where we talk about how at different levels. And one thing to keep in mind that while the energy, uh, the frequency and the wavelength of the energy in AFA is constant, you cannot move it. The power level can always be varied, which is why you are seeing this symbol uh, which is which looks like an inverted Wi-Fi symbol. It's our symbol for AFA. It somewhere it's big. Uh, it's bigger, big, medium, small. Because in a certain sample preparation workflow, you can use AFA at every step. And I'll come to it again uh, when I get to the protein data. Uh, that where you can use AFA at different levels, at different power levels but you, you can use it throughout without jeopardizing the integrity of your sample, but ensuring maximization of analyte recovery. So um, if I think about it, um, because AFA has been in existence for a long, long time, uh, it's been, uh, I think that our company was formed in 1999. Uh, AFA has been used extensively before that, at least for two, three years, so it's probably not uh, unfair to say that it has been in existence for close to 25 years now. Now, when that happens, and of course there are different applications and you can do your own, uh, you know, uh, scholar search or publication search to see how many AFA applications actually are there uh, in terms of publications. We see publications coming out almost um, at least between the genomic side and proteomic side, we see multiple publications coming out almost every week where they're using uh, AFA. But it's not just that. I mean, AFA's application has been used across a host of different kind of um, analyte, uh, matrix type, and hence applications uh, ranging from uh, tissue biomarker extraction, um, hybridization, enrichment of samples, protein analysis, cell lysis, genomics, um, metabolomics, biomarkers, so on and so forth. In particular, where uh, it really made a huge change is when AFA was used, uh, this was years ago, uh, in a next-gen sequencing, next-generation sequencing lab. And since then, it's fair to say that 80 to 85 percent of next generation sequencing or NGS labs use AFA for DNA sharing. So especially all NGS labs, DNA sharing means it's short read. So it's anywhere between 175 base pairs to 1000 or 1 KB. So within that time frame or within that base pair range frame, AFA is considered to be the gold standard and almost like I said, 80 to 85 percent of NGS labs are using AFA for sharing the DNA. And that's why we kind of say that, you know, there are several methods that are out there, enzymatic and so on and so forth. And there is a reason why everybody should actually focus or stay focused on using AFA for multiple reasons. And of course, um, you can, I mean, this is one application that has the ability to give you DNA and RNA together. 
so that you don't have to, if you're doing working with both analytes, you don't have to run two different samples. You can potentially work with the same sample and get DNA and RNA. And FFP is a brilliant example that we have actually uh, established and published and also launched a workflow to that uh, regard. Um, ideally speaking, AFA does, does not show any bias when it comes to sharing. So you don't see any AT or GC bias which is definitely not the case when you're working with enzymes because your whole library prep probably is based on the assumption that enzymes will have a certain bias, like say a GC bias. Um, typically, we see a narrow distribution uh, when it comes to DNA sharing with AFA so that you, you know, um, your total deviation from your target base pair range is very, very narrow. So you get a very tight uh, distribution of shear DNA, mostly maximizing the total uh, um, yield of DNA in the specific uh, base pair range that you are looking for, which helps eventually to your in your amplification, sequencing, so on and so forth. Um, you do not need to use any beads or anything, um, which is typically you you would use otherwise. Um, it has got very high tolerance for mass variation, which ensures that AF is a lot more reproducible. And I can go on and on um, that, you know, uh, you don't necessarily, you can have multiple different base pair ranges all addressed during shearing in with one workflow. So there are a whole bunch of things that you can actually see additional flexibility. Uh, better uh, increased robustness, reliability, reproducibility coming from AFA. So that was in general AFA for DNA shearing. And when it comes to, you know, as I already mentioned, it's the gold standard for DNA shearing. It is, um, you know, it is now heavily getting used as the sample prep protocol or a sample prep platform for multi-omics. Um, it is used extensively for a uh, higher throughput capability. So it's not just about having uh, to work with one sample at a time. If you are trying to work with 96 samples or 384 samples, we have instruments that can cater to that much faster, much better, much reliable. Um, you have, we also have workflow solutions that can enable you to not just think that oh, this is an ultrasonic gator, but what I do with it is something I'll have to figure out. But we can provide you with workflow solutions where you we can give you a holistic approach where you start with your, let's say, your scroll, tissue scrolls or cell lysates, and you go all the way to getting your analytes out and working directly with them. So speaking of workflow solutions, one thing that we always have figured, I've seen in the past also that when it comes to FFPE, there are several challenges that are typically faced, countered in the labs. Um, of course, um, it is the gold standard uh, for preserving tissues, especially for you know cancer labs, and cancer research, and so on and so forth. Um, and it, when the preserved tissues are taken out of the block of wax, uh, the isolated analytes can be used for monitoring a lot of different markers, which is essentially, you know, a gold standard for that application is oncology. But in not just in DNA, we are also seeing that there is a significant amount of emphasis being implied on RNA. And RNA-seq or RNA sequencing is also very important nowadays to uh, understanding the oncogenes, understanding uh, whether a tumor is cancerous or not. And that's why there is a bigger demand for isolation, extraction, and purification of DNA and RNA from FFP. But we all know that that is not easy. It's easier said than done because the standard processes that we have today, there are several challenges. Number one, is extraction of FFPE, which is typically done today with lots of chemicals like xylene or mineral oil and so on and so forth. We call them 
uh, in uh, deparf the incomplete deparfenization or harsh deparfenization. What that means is you are doing multiple washes in this passive deparfenization process. You're doing a multiple washes of your uh, sample scrolls with where the tissue or a part of the tissue is embedded still in a lot of wax, and you are washing it over and over again. Enduring which, because of the aggressive, harmful chemicals, it's also affecting the tissues, which essentially is affecting the quality of your analytes. Um, your exposure to these harsh chemicals is, of course, uh, another point of concern that is definitely very, very important for everybody to be uh, aware of. Um, how do you, when you have degradation of your tissues, how do you ensure that you can actually maximize the total yield of analytes from that? It is quite difficult. Hence, it is important for you to actually figure out uh, how many, the minimum number of washes that can maximize the total amount of analytes that you're going to get. But that is also very difficult because your minimum number of washes may not be enough to remove all the paraffin that are there. So it's a balance and it is always not giving you the answer that you need. And it becomes even worse when you're using or working with a bunch of samples. So you probably want to, everything to be automated. You want it to be in a liquid handler system, but unfortunately you can't because uh, very obviously you have a scenario where even working with one sample, ensuring reliability, reproducibility is difficult. So, um, first coming to the point of using AFA, where we call it for FFPE, it's uh, it's an active a, de active deparfenization. What that means is, no longer do you have to wash your scrolls with any organic chemicals. Nothing, no mineral oil needed, no xylene needed. Just the energy itself can emulsify the wax or the paraffin and expose the tissue. So the cavitation bubbles that are created by applying this acoustic energy to your sample, it is good enough, strong enough at this frequency in a certain power level to actively deparaffinize the tissue and completely also homogenize the tissue without damaging any of the sensitive analytes such as RF. So it is reproducible, it's reliable, it's robust, it's fast, it's effective. So, and then that led us to creation uh, of a certain workflow, which we released earlier this year in, in the month of February at an automation conference, which happened in Boston in the United States, where we launched our uh, automated or manual version. You can have either way, depending on the number of samples you're working with, for uh, FFPE, uh, ensuring DNA and RNA extraction, isolation, and purification. And so you can work with a 96 sample plate, or you can work with more samples, multiple batches of 96 samples, it can, we can make it happen with any of the liquid handlers. So some of the big things that we are seeing, um, because this, this deparaffinization process is very, very uh, effective. It is, uh, it ensures that there is no degradation. There is no loss of analytes. So we need a lot less amount of uh, samples to start with. So while most of the other organizations for their FFPE kit are using a higher scroll uh, volume or scroll uh, length, 40 microns or 30 microns or 70 microns, we actually use uh, a 10 micron scroll. So in other words, you can then now um, have like a smaller tube to work with. You have fewer scrolls to work with uh, or you need to work it, um, which means faster way for you to get your samples directly uh, into the into the tubes, into the well plates, and then uh, 
faster timeline to get to your DNA and RNA. So the workflow stands something like this, and this is the workflow for DNA and RNA coming together. So the first few steps are focused on, you know, loading your sample, adding the rehydration buffer and our deparathenization solution, which we provide, and you incubate it for five minutes. And with AFA, you have already taken care of, you've removed the paraffin and you've got also homogenized the tissue. And thereafter, further homo incubation results in creation of a pellet and a supernatant. Now your pellet is where all your DNA is and your supernatant is where your RNA is. So you separate them and then you reverse crosslink your RNA, uh, you add the binding buffer, magnetic beads and proceed with RNA purification for the DNA because that's in the pellet. You first have to homogenize the pellet, reconstitute in the buffer and then follow the same thing uh, add the binding buffer, magnetic beads, and proceed with DNA purification. So typically, and this is not considering an automated system like a liquid handler, uh, a, a more advanced liquid handler like a Hamilton or a TCAN, a uh, standard link setup, you can get your RNA and DNA somewhere around five hours from scroll all the way to DNA for a 96 well plate. So 96 samples or 96 scrolls, starting with scroll all the way to pure DNA and RNA, you have it in five hours. So typically that's a significant savings based on what we hear from our users in terms of just in terms of time. So when we think about it, this is how the total auto 96 kit or our true extract FFP total Nucleic acid auto 96 kit. We call it total nucleic acid because it's DNA and RNA. So you are provided with the whole workflow. You are provided with all the consumables that you need. Uh, here is the instrument, which is uh, we use an R230 or an LE220 series uh, instrument, and we can make it work with any liquid handler. If you're using automation, if you're using it manual, you probably don't need to worry about it. Um, the rest of it can be used manually. So we also provide guidelines for that. So uh, I'll straight away jump into some of the data that uh, we have and others have also published. So to begin with, uh, we are talking about uh, uh, four different tissue types. So we see brain, I mean, these are all cancerous tissues or, or from tumors obtained from brain, uh, breast, colon, and lung. Um, you can see that for the brain, uh, it's a it's a lot of tissue in the paraffin block. Uh, clearly, it won't be something like my brain because I will never have that amount of brain. Um, but uh, this was probably a very smart and uh, individual. So, but on the other hand, lung tissues are really small in size. So, what we what they once we got these paraffin blocks, we used a 10 micron scroll which we cut using a rotary microtome at room temperature. And then each of the scrolls were placed in the tubes. And then we used the workflow that I just explained in the previous slide. So um, first to be uh, deparaffinized, followed by uh, pelleting of the DNA and uh, supernatant uh, containing RNA. Then we isolated them and purified both the analytes and we then monitored the quality in terms of the yield and amplifiability of both RNA and DNA. So you get the qubit scores, 260-280, nanometer ratios, or the DV200 scores for RNA, and you also get the same, and the molecular weight distribution or kappa QC for uh, qPCR for the DNA. So uh, here's some data. So when I mentioned in the previous slide or the slides that uh, there are some significant, uh, I mean, so we have both a uh, manual and um, automated uh, uh, version of this particular workflow for DNA and RNA. So you see the performance of both the manual and the automated are compared here. 
So you can see they're very, very comparable in terms of their performance between the automated, which is the dark blue, and the manual, which is the light blue. So you can see um, in each of the cases, the yellow bar is essentially the yield obtained from other kits that are commercially available. So not just in the total amount of yield, the quality of RNA that you see from the nano drop, the 260, 280, 260, 230 ratios also tell you that compared to the other uh, commonly available kit, uh, the true extract actually uh, provided better quality of RNA, both in terms, in terms of yield and pure yield. So it's not just about getting RNA, it's also about getting how much of pure RNA you are getting. And then comes the question of understanding the RNA that I got, is it amplifiable? So we here are the reports of the FRQs and also the DV200 scores that are showing um, much better amplifiability for these RNA. Once again, see that uh, your auto and the manual, both kits are performing at the same level, at a very similar level, and both of them are significantly better than what you see or what you get with other commercially available kits. Um, similarly, for DNA, uh, the yield of DNA extracted from these FFPE tissues um, are between the auto and the manual are very, very similar, very, very comparable. And uh, whatever you see from competition, that those kits, uh, the other things, uh, other kits commercially that are available are significantly lacking um, especially in two tissues, namely the breast tumor and the colon. So that tells you that if you are working with a very small amount of samples, which is usually the case when you're getting such tissues, you don't have a lot of samples. And you want to be very, very confident of your analysis. And if you get um, significantly less quality of analytes out at the very beginning, no matter how much of a good sequencer you are using, how uh, you know how act effectively you are amplifying, it will always become very, very difficult for you to get quality and confident data. So not just the yield and purity, but also in terms of amplifiability and molecular weight, we are seeing um, significant better quality, better data. So. Uh, this is just in terms of the DNA yield and quality. What happens when you take it to the next level where you you got the DNA and you have to shear it down? So here the goal was to shear it down to 175 base pairs. So what we did was to look at DNA uh, obtained using our workflow and anything that comes from the competitor. So uh, this is all brain tissues. So while the DNA profile, uh, pre-shearing looks quite reasonable and similar to each other. Once you shear, you see a lot more variability in uh, the shear DNA using commercially available other kits versus what you would get with our kit. And you can continue to use other tissue sources, whether it's uterus or kidney, you get the same results. So 175 base pair shearing, you see much better reproducibility from AFA and true extract compared to what you would get otherwise. Uh, same thing with kidney, you get much better reproducibility with true extract than the competitor or other kits that are available. Um, then you move on to colon and uh, uterine uh, tissues uh, or cancer tissues, you get you see the same trend. So you see extracted DNA having uh, at the same level, post-sharing, much better shared DNA. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, that AFA-generated sharing gives you a much tighter distribution. So if you are looking at getting 175 base pairs, your deviation is probably plus minus five or something like that at best. However, uh, there is, of course, you know, a lot more variability when you're working with enzymes. Similarly, over here, you are looking at different kinds of other commercially available kits that are looking at, you know, 
working with FFP samples directly, and you, because it's inefficient and not using AFA, you see a lot higher variability over there. So that's just internal data, but we also can highlight some publications where we are looking at, you know, are the users over here, this is out of Finland, where they're looking at comparison, especially uh, high throughput sequencing analysis. They're looking at the both extraction and isolation and purification of gene and RNA from FFP materials uh, for high throughput sequencing. And um, they are doing a comparison of all the kits uh, that were available or that are available today. And they are monitoring the efficiency of the assay by understanding the quantity, quality, and performance of both DNA and RNA. So this particular table highlights all the kits that they have looked into. You can actually look at the paper. Here's the reference for that. Um, they're looking at DNA and RNA uh, using our kits, um, but you know they are also using several other kits from Kaijin, Beckman, um, so on and so forth. So straight away jumping into the results. Uh, so they are looking at multiple different tissue types. So they're all like termed as SARC-1, SARC-2, SARC-3, 4, 5. I mean, they have multiple samples. Uh, they are all sarcoma tissue samples obtained from different organs. So heart, um, brain, lung, kidney, liver, colon, so on and so forth. So um, what they are reporting over here and what you can see also that you actually see a lot more um, better DNA uh, and RNA using the true extract and AFA compared to everything else that they monitored. I mean, while these parts are common, you can see that you are getting a better response from AFA in terms of the specific uh, DNA sequences that can eventually post, once you put it into the library post sequencing, you have better mapping that way to specific oncogenes. Uh, similarly, you get something better over here. Uh, the 089 is common, but three, the nine is always higher than four. Uh, and you can continue to look into other areas, uh, you know, over here also, true extract performs better, uh, also this particular tissue samples. So just to quote uh, this publication, what they highlighted in there uh, at the conclusion, of this publication is that what you use for your extraction method, for your sample preparation method to extract, isolate, and purify RNA and DNA is basically going to determine the confidence and the results that you're going to get. So what your findings are not necessarily only dependent on the efficiency and the excellence of your end detection tools. So, you know, you could be using the best and the most expensive sequencer in the world and the best kit for associated with it. But if you add bad samples to it, as we all know, junk in is equal to junk out. So uh, here also we see the same thing that's happening that, you know, um, if you do your sample prep properly and ensure reliability or reproducibility of your sample prep, you're bound to get better quality and more confidence in the data that you can do, you're seeing at the other end. So uh, next up, you know, um, we are uh, past the halfway mark. And so I'm going to go quickly move over to the other analyte uh, out of cells that are of uh, significantly more important, you know, higher importance. And uh, it's gaining a lot more importance as also as a part of the multi-omic strategy that a lot of the precision medicine laboratories are using today, but not just because of that from a biomarker analysis and all those perspectives, it is gaining more and more importance. And here are some of the examples I'm going to highlight. Primarily, like I mentioned, that when it comes to protein analysis, it is very important for, one, for all of us to realize that proteins are probably a lot more complex to work with compared to DNA and RNA. One of the biggest reasons is that proteins have 20 different subtypes, 
which are called the amino acids, and as opposed to four units, subunits, typically seen in DNA or RNA. So you have more variability or endogenous variability in proteins. The other thing about proteins is that proteins um, are not necessarily amplifiable. So if you end up with a very small amount of a certain DNA sequence or a DNA uh, in a certain base pair, you can amplify it and then you still have enough to work with and sequence it. You cannot do that with proteins typically in more standard ways, uh, which is also inexpensive. <coughs> so um, we with AFA can actually make proteins work and do the whole protein analysis, starting with tissues or cell lysates. You can disrupt the tissue, homogenize the cell lysates. You can do your purification, binding of the proteins by adding your sp3 beads or anything that you want to. You can do your digestion and the resuspension of your peptides into your LCMS friendly buffer. <laughs> All of that in one plate so that you do not have to take samples in and into another plate or move them around. So we provide a one plate or one pot sample preparation protocol when it comes to proteins from FFPE. So the front part, which is deparaffinization, is identical to what I have already mentioned in the previous section of this presentation. This particular presentation section is going to talk about just working with the protein samples from FFPE. So first up, I mean, you know, this is a uh, work done by Matthias Mann um, out of uh, uh, in Europe, where he actually worked with FFPE samples to come up with a high throughput capability of uh, extracting, isolating, purifying, digesting proteins to do bottom-up analysis. So this is also available on our website as uh, you know, we have this application note. And this was also published in Molecular Systems Biology uh, two years ago. So essentially what they have done, uh, they have, I'm highlighting just a fresh frozen tissue, but it's the same thing with the FFPE with deparaffinization step added in, is that they used these tissue types um, and then they developed a fully automated system or workflow with the Agile and Tassima Bravo, and where they perform the disulfide bond reduction, the cis alkylation, addition of sp3 for immunodepletion of proteins, then followed by digestion of the proteins, generation of peptide reconstitution, and into the LCMS. All of that done, were done in the same 96 well plate, as you can see, with AFA happening in the background. So, that was two years ago. This year at ASMS um, in uh, in Minneapolis, we had Sloan Kettering Cancer Center from New York and the director of the facility, of the proteomics facility over there, uh, presented at our breakfast workshop where she talked about, Jessica Chapman talked about uh, how she's using AFA to minimize the total number of steps with AFA from compared to what she had. So not only did she make her whole workflow a lot faster, but she over here real highlighted some basic things that you know FFP tissues are typically compatible with NS-based analysis. However, um, you you cannot just put wax in LCMS for sure. So what you need to do in here is that you need to develop a, a bottom-up strategy where you have robust, fast, scalable, high throughput workflow for not just extraction, isolation, purification, digestion of proteins, it's also including the first step, which is the deparaffinization. And AFA allowed her to actually get very good data. As you can see, that homogenization of the FFPE using the Covaris instrument that she talks about here, which is an LE220 RSC, uh, extracts a uh, very good protein profile that are not only similar in terms of the total yield and um, number of proteins, 
that they, she was getting. But remember, initially she was spending the amount of time that she was spending for one sample. She's spending less time now for a lot more samples. So that was one. And then she also found out that when it comes to digestion of proteins, typically a digestion profile is what? 12 hours, 16 hours at 37 degrees. Here, she digested her samples in for three hours with AFA, and she got some significant num amount of digestion, almost 95 to 98% of digestion efficiency with very little missed cleavages happening. So this is another thing that I mentioned in one of the slides where, there, where um, you can see that when you work with AFA, you don't necessarily have to use AFA only at certain spots. Uh, it's not just for disruption, which is where you would use a common sonication system. It's not for uh, homogenization only. You can use AFA for enhancing your digestion time or reducing your digestion time and enhancing digestion efficiency. You can use AFA for enhancing binding efficiency during immunodepletion, so on and so forth. So it's saving time in every step without compromising your efficiency, if not enhancing your efficiency. Uh, here is another example of using a different instrument for protein extraction, where we are re working with human liver samples obtained from FFPE. So a combination of eating and AFA uh, was, was essentially talks about, you know, how uh, to do the reverse cross-linking, removing paraffin from tissue samples. And this particular step allows uh, us to actually get uh, a lot more protein IDs because we are getting a lot more peptides. In this particular case, all the identification done was done using a fluorometric kit, but you could be very well sending the samples over to an LCMS for running the LCMS assays. So, uh, I can continue to go, and I wish I could actually go, but we are almost like, you know, uh, 15, 14, 15 minutes away from uh, the, com uh, the getting to the top of the hour. So I want to highlight a few other things before I wind up. So when it comes to proteins, we have a whole lot of workflows, just as I mentioned, for the true extract workflow for DNA and RNA. We have a lot of workflows also optimized in isolation, uh, of proteins uh, from FFPE uh, bound tissues, uh, and then digestion of those immunodepletion or purification of those proteins, followed by digestion and eventually uh, LCMS based analysis. So we won't necessarily provide the LCMS, which you already, those of you who are using LCMS, you have very good LCMS in your lab, but we can definitely help you enhance the quality of data that you are getting today by enhancing the extraction amount, isolation, purification, digestion of your samples, starting with the FFPE scrolls. So in summary, um, as we are all aware of, uh, that's why we are talking today, is that FFPE is gaining a lot of importance and almost every day. So this growing demand of FFPE because, you know, uh, that's another way of preserving the tissues. Um, it also requires every laboratory to actually focus heavily in processing FFPE samples, uh, which has to be robust, reliable, reproducible. And whether you are working with DNA and RNA or you're working with proteins, either way, you need to have reliability, robustness, reproducibility. And so while the workflows will be different, but AFA is that one common point of technology that can work with every single laboratory, every single workflow, enhancing the quality of samples. And it's not just about doing one sample once, it's about from one sample many times or once to many samples many times. So addressing the throughput requirement at every single step. Um, we do have a lot of uh, products in our um, in our uh, portfolio uh, from products that they are lined up over here in terms of their throughput capability. 
So we've got, you know, the ones on the left side of the screen. Um, this is uh, all the way you know, to here can do uh, any one sample at a time, one sample at a time to one to eight, eight samples at a time. And then you move over. Here are the instruments where you can put a 96 well plate or a 384 well plate. We also provide uh, specific proprietary consumables that you can use with these instruments that enhance the AFA uh, energy uh, capability to create those cavitation bubbles that results in shearing of DNA, RNA, disruption of tissues, homogenization of cell lysates, uh, faster digestion, better binding for protein analysis. So uh, that's about it from my end. Um, we are I'm at it's 10 for I mean, well, it's 46 minutes past the hour, 47 minutes past the hour. At this point of time, I'll probably um, hand it over to CK who and um, if there are any questions or if there are any questions now that comes to your mind, I would be more than happy to answer.